and crack map ex and crack map Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. Uh, in this video, I want to kick off a new series where I'm exploring artifact detections as I relate to an attacker's TTPs or tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? Um, and specifically, I want to create more uh, shorter digestible videos that really just focus and hone in on a specific artifact or technique or detection method that we have as analysts or within digital forensic investigations, uh, you know, that can assist us in retracing an attack timeline or uh, just putting events in more context. And throughout this video, you're going to see me use the terms crack map exec and net exec interchangeably. They're basically the same tool. There was some drama there around, uh, I, I guess, the original creators and then net exec sort of became a fork off of the original crack map exec. I don't really care to learn the drama uh, or really fuel into it. But uh, for this case, I'm going to use the newer and more stable net exec. But just know that the same methodology applies uh, between each tool, right? And so what I want to do today is showcase some of the artifacts that get generated when an attacker or a penetration tester is doing something like enumerating shares uh, using valid domain user credentials through something like NetExec, right? Uh, because there are, again, forensic artifacts that get sort of touched or created on disk uh, that we can use for detections or uh, to sort of infer that uh, a potential enumeration has taken place, right? Uh, and so what I have here in the lab, just a very simple setup. Uh, what you're looking at here is just DC01 or my domain controller that I set up. I don't know if I can just figure out how to log in here and type in my password correctly. There you go. So again, very simple setup here, uh, but you can see I have a shared folder on my desktop here of the domain controller. And so obviously in, in you know in practice, we wouldn't be doing this on the actual domain controller itself. Maybe we would have a file share or a file server somewhere else in the environment. But just again, for simplicity's sake, we only need two VMs for this setup. And so this folder or share here is just an example. You can see it's called, uh, you know, 2024 financials, right? And there's just a sample PDF in here. Uh, but this might be referring to some sort of sensitive financial documents that an attacker might want to get their hands on if they've sort of breached uh, into this network, right? And you can see if I just right click on properties here and go over to sharing, uh, you can see this folder is in fact shared on the network here from, again, this domain controller in this case. Uh, and we do have some uh, permissions in place. We have a sample user called Adrian Dittman. <laughs> and uh, right now he just has sort of of read access, right? So he can't write. Uh, and so this is going to be our starting point here. And my other system here is just our simulated attacker, which is running Kali Linux, right? And these two machines here are on the same network, right? So from my attacker controlled machine, uh, what I can do is just ping 10.0.2.15, for example, and we should get some replies from our domain controller, right? And so obviously this is an assumed breach scenario, right? So an attacker has managed to get some sort of internal into this network, you know, whether they be physically on the network, um, with a you know Kali Linux system, or they're sort of uh, you know using a jump box or something, they've breached a, a system and they're sort of running their tools through that in sort of a pivoting scenario. Doesn't really matter the specifics. Uh, the point is we're going to use our attacker machine here to simulate some uh, enumeration commands using net exec or crack map exec. And then we're gonna look at some detection methods that might clue us into, you know, hey, an attacker might be trying to enumerate systems here uh, or different network shares, or they might be trying to, uh, you know, maybe they're preparing to move laterally throughout the network, right? And so very simple scenario. All we need to do is just sort of run our enumeration, right? So I'm just going to run net exec, for example, and then I'm going to point it to the SMB protocol, right? And then I'm going to provide the IP address of our file server, in this case, our domain controller, right? So that's going to be 10.0.2.15. And then we need to provide uh, valid user credentials on the domain, right? And you can see here, if we hop back over, if I just click on properties here, if we look at the actual, uh, you know, file system permissions that I have assigned here, uh, you can see for this Adrian Dittman user, we have read access, right? So uh, let's just use him for our example. That is the username that we've chosen. And the password here is just going to be uh, password one, two, three, right? And so maybe the attackers already roasted some poor user and cracked their hash uh, or figured out in some way a uh, user's credentials, right? Which is often, you know, pretty much 90% of scenarios uh, is the way in for these sort of internal engagements, right? Uh, and all we're going to do here is just enumerate the shares, right? And so I'm just going to provide tac tac shares, as you can see here. And this should be all we need to basically say, you know, hey, uh, let me impersonate this user here using his credentials. And what sort of access do we have on this file server, right? Do we have any read access to any, uh, you know, uh, shares or do we have write access, right? What, what can we do, right? Because in some cases, if we can write to a share, we might actually be able to get some uh, command execution through that, right? In some uh, more additional ways, which is sort of out of scope for uh, this specific video, right? We're just going to be doing enumeration here. And you can see, I might need to zoom out a bit. We were able to basically enumerate the shares uh, that are currently being served on our domain controller, right? So we have some of the default ones like admin, C dollar sign, right? Uh, IPC. 
but we do have, in fact, the uh, financial uh, share that you can see here. If we look under permissions, you can see we have read access, right? And so in this case, nothing's really changed, right? Uh, if I head back over to our domain controller here, if I open up our file server, nothing has actually changed. Uh, same kind of thing. All we did was just enumerate, you know, hey, what do we have read access to? However, when we perform this command, uh, you know, net exec or crack map exec, again, these two tools work the same way pretty much. Uh, they're going to try to write temporary files to this share uh, in order to see, you know, hey, do we actually have write access, right? Similar to if you were um, testing out an, an FTP server and saying, hey, you know, do I have write access to this FTP server? Because if so, I might be able to upload something malicious and, you know, do that kind of thing, right? Um, and so in this case, we can see this. If I provide the debug option, right, with this uh, two dashes debug, and then we run the same thing, it's going to give us a ton more information, right? So if I just scroll through some of this header information, uh, you're going to see all of the different things that it's doing, right? Uh, so again, you can see it's creating this SMB connection. Uh, it's trying to connect to the IP address. Uh, and as we keep scrolling down, you're going to see it's trying to sort of uh, look through different shares, right? So uh, it's trying to check read access on the admin dollar sign, right? Uh, for example, do I have the ability to write a file on disk? And in this case, we have access denied, right? So it's not able to actually do that. Now, what if we did have write access to that financial folder as the Adrian Dittman user? Well, all we're going to do here is go over to our domain controller and give that user write access, right? So I'm just going to go under the sort of uh, NTFS file system permissions, go under this Adrian Dittman user, and then I'm going to click on edit here to edit the permissions. And again, under this Adrian user, I'm going to add the write permission here. Just click apply. OK, there we go. Head back over to our attacker machine, and I'm just going to run the same command again to enumerate the shares. There we go. You can see that completed. And now same kind of thing, but now we have the write permission that was not there previously, right? And so my question is, how did NetExec know that we have this write permission now, right? And so let's try to run the debug command again and see what is actually happening, right? So this is going to take a second again. I'm going to scroll down to find that um, specific share for the financials. And can see some interesting things here, right? So we're no longer seeing any write access errors for that financial folder, right? But we are seeing some new errors or additional errors now uh, in terms of deleting these temporary files that I just mentioned, right? And so you can see here under the financial share, it looks like it's trying to delete a temporary directory uh, with this strange set of characters, right? And also a temporary file with, again, a strange set of 10 random characters with a dot txt file format, right? And it's trying to delete these two files or this file and directory, but it can't because it doesn't have delete access on the share, right? We only gave it that write access, which is pretty common if you're giving someone, uh, you know, write access to a share. By default, they're not going to inherit that delete access as well unless we uh, give them modify access, right? And so with that, uh, that's an artifact, right? These are forensic artifacts that we can now have on disk uh, to alert us, you know, hey, something is going on here, right? Because sure enough, if I head back over to our domain controller, open up our directory, and look at that, we have the two different uh, sets of checks that we performed, right? We just performed two of them, one of them with the debug flag. And we now have, uh, again, this very strange empty text document here and also this empty directory because, again, these tools are checking to see if we have write access. In order to do that, they have to attempt to write something to disk. And then to clean up their tracks, they're obviously going to delete it immediately afterwards, right? But in this case, by default, they cannot. And how do we know that we can actually rely on this artifact? Well, let's take a look at the tool itself, right? So I just have the GitHub repository here for NetExec. Uh, and if I head down to the NetExec folder here, I'm going to try to find the smb.py uh, file, right? Because if you remember, when we were looking at our debug statements here, you can see it's pointing to this smb.py file, right? And so we can find this directly from our sort of execution folder here, right? So if I uh, just do a which NetExec, and again, you'll have to install NetExec if you don't have it by default. But again, I can just start poking around in this tool folder here to basically find this, uh, you know, script. Or again, I'm just going to go straight to the source here. And so in this case, I'm going to go under protocols. And then we should be able to find the smb.py script, right? And now this is a pretty big file, right? This is a sort of module that gets ingested into NetExec. And so what I'm going to do here is just do a control F or a control, uh, you know, search here uh, for a .txt. And in this case, immediately we're taken to this sort of shares uh, method here where you can see is setting up that temporary directory again with that random string of characters and setting up that temporary file with, again, random string of characters and then adding a dot txt. And so what is this function, right? Well, let me try to find this uh, again. I'm going to do a control F for that gen underscore random string. 
and it looks like it's being imported here. You can see we're near the top of the file here, so we're importing uh, from the uh, NetExec helpers miscellaneous, right? And so that's gonna be in another location. So if I go back up to the NXC folder, jump under helpers, uh, we should be able to find the miscellaneous.py file. And again, I'm just gonna do a search for get random string, and here, uh, you know, in all of its glory is that random string function. You can see by default, it's passing in the length of 10 characters, I assume, right? Uh, yeah, you, you can see that there. And so what it's basically doing is just running the ASCII underscore letters sort of built in uh, function here, I guess you could say. And by default here, this is going to generate a random 10 character string of all A to Z characters or the capital A through Z characters as well, right? And so now that we know sort of the tools endpoint level artifacts, we can use this and create detection rules, right? It doesn't matter what solution we use, right? Whether it's Yara or, uh, you know, SIM rules using endpoint logs or, uh, you know, any kind of stretch of the imagination, uh, we know the makeup, right? We know what these files are gonna look like, these, these files and directories. Uh, you know, we know the source. And so we can use whatever we want to detect this, whether it be in the logs or, uh, you know, within the, the file system or we could potentially look at network artifacts as well, right? But uh, typically SMB version three traffic is gonna be encrypted, so that might pose some challenges. Uh, or if we just keep it strictly to the endpoint level, we could also look at different endpoint related logs, right? Like Sysmon logs. And so what we can do, I'm gonna head back to my domain controller here and install Sysmon and then run the same sort of attack again or enumeration uh, and see what gets logged, right? And so I'm gonna use the ever famous uh, Swift on security Sysmon configuration file, right? As our sort of starting point here, uh, because what we're gonna to wanna to monitor for in this case is the file create IDs, right? Uh, you can see here the file create operations are logged when a file is created or overwritten. And this is exactly what we're looking for when we're dealing with this kind of uh, artifact, this disk related artifact that gets left over, right? But we're gonna to need to make some modifications to this base sort of configuration file to include that, you know, hey, we want to monitor also for uh, any file creation events on our administrator's desktop, right? And of course, that's just because of the example scenario that we've set up here. Uh, but, you know, discussing Sysmon uh, configuration strategies is sort of out of scope for this video, right? Um, but what we're gonna do is basically change our configuration file here to include this directory. And so I just have this saved here in my Sysmon folder. I'm going to open that up with notepad, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I'm gonna find those event code 11, uh, or, you know, gonna find where we sort of define our uh, Sysmon event 11s. There we go, so we have the file created here, as you can see, let me zoom in. Uh, 10, 11, there we go. And so I'm just going to add an additional target file name here, right? Uh, and so what I can do is just add basically I'm just gonna add a comment here, for example, because uh, again, uh, we're not actually doing this in production, right? Um, and then I'm just going to add, uh, in this case, the target file name. Uh, what I can do is just copy this example line, paste that in, clean everything up, uh, and yeah, basically just fill, uh, modify this to work for our scenario. And so for the condition, I'm gonna make sure that it begins with, right? So I'm going to add begin with, and then I wanna point it over to C, users, administrator, and we should be good to go, right? So I'm just gonna save that. Uh, and now I'm gonna install Sysmon using this configuration, right? And apologies for the very small font here, but hopefully you can see what I'm doing. Uh, and then just accept ULA. I'm gonna hit enter there and that should be installed, right? And so now we have Sysmon monitoring and we're logging events, right? And so what I'm gonna do is just run the exact same thing from our attacker machine. So let me sign back in here. And then I'm just going to up arrow once uh, or maybe a few times. Uh, to basically run that shares command again. I should just take a second, there we go. Hop back over, and of course we could in theory be, you know, uh, forwarding off our sysmon logs over to a sim, for example, in production. But in this case, I'm just going to open up the event viewer because, uh, you know, we're, we're keeping things simple here. And I'm gonna find our sysmon logs under, whoops, under uh, application and service logs, under Microsoft. And then if I can expand, we're gonna go under Windows, and then we're gonna find sysmon. There we go, we'll open up the operation logs and we should see in this case, uh, some file creation events, right? And so if we really wanted to, we could filter the log uh, for only those event code 11s and we should be able to figure out what we're doing here, right? And so we have PowerShell, not what we're looking for. However, the second one here is in fact uh, the directory that was created, right? So you can see here we have the system process in this case creating under that uh, specific share, that 10 digit or that 10 character directory, right? With these random letters. Uh, this next one should be the text file, right? And of course it is. So there you go, you can see, again, under the same directory, we have this random 10 character file with a .txt or .txt extension. And so again, here is our artifact, right? This is our detection that we can use. Uh, you know, we might want to create a sim rule. 
And so maybe in Splunk, for example, or SPL, uh, we create some sort of alert or rule that looks for the target file name uh, field, right? And maybe we're looking for a 10 character, you know, value that ends in a .txt, right? So we could use some wildcards there or some pattern matching, right? Uh, for example, what we can do is open up, uh, you know, regex, for example, right? So uh, if we just go to uh, regex 101, we can start to create a pattern that will match for this, right? Uh, so for example, uh, under our sort of regular expression here, what I can do is open up some brackets. And within this, I'm going to add, you know, hey, I want to match A to Z, you know, A through Z. Uh, and then also the capital A uh, through the capital Z as well, right? So we want to match all of those uh, single characters present in, uh, you know, the alphabet, whether it be lowercase or uppercase, right? However, we don't just want to match one character, right? And so what we can do here within uh, these fancy curly brackets, uh, we can say, you know, hey, I want to match 10 digits, right? Or 10 different instances of uh, this range here, right? So this is sort of our quantifier, and this is going to be our different ranges, right? So very simple regex here. And then, you know, hey, we might want to say we want to match a .txt file extension, right? So we can get very specific if we wanted to. And so, for example, if I head back to, you know, our sysmon log here, I can copy this file path. And, you know, maybe this is our target file name that we're matching in our sim. I can paste that into our test string here. And you can see here by the blue highlight, we are, in fact, getting a match uh, for that file, right? So, uh, again, this could be uh, any kind of file, right? As long as it's 10 digits and sort of matches that syntax, right? Doesn't really matter what we have here, we are still going to match uh, based off of our regex, right? So just an example here, right? I'm not going to go through specific SIM instances and create alerts and rules. I just want to focus on the methodology of the detection method itself, right? And so hopefully you found that interesting. One last thing I will uh, say just for the benefit of any, uh, you know, red teamers we have on call. What if you want to uh, maybe, uh, you know, advance your OPSEC a little bit and not get caught using this kind of simple detection? Well, fortunately, uh, again, this is sort of the default uh, behavior of NetExec or crack map exec. But again, if you were concerned about your OPSEC, what you can do is add the uh, dash dash no dash right dash check and that's not going to perform that specific check for us right uh, which in this case we're not going to obviously get the uh, enumeration back that we do have right access right and so there's some pros and cons here depending on your specific use case and so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, like I said, I'm hoping to make this some sort of a series on the channel where I look at different artifacts or uh, whether it be something in the logs or something over the network or in the registry, right? So different forensic artifacts per chance uh, and how they can be useful to us uh, during investigations, right? And so again, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe if you could. Uh, that would be great. And I will hopefully see you again for the next video.